Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this design challenge webinar. I'm just going to give us a few minutes for people to join the room. Um, so just bear with us. We only have about six people in the room right now. So just give us a couple minutes. See you back here. Okay, hope everyone can see that. Yep. Okay, I think just two more minutes and we'll begin. Hi everybody, if you're just joining now. Hi Matt, we can see you now. It's great. Yeah, rough and ready here. Great. Great to see you, Matt. Okay, if you're just joining now, we're just giving it a few more minutes until everyone can join. Um, numbers peaking up, so. If you're just joining now, everybody, we're giving it a uh, little less than one minute left until um, we'll begin the webinar and um, get it going while people still join. Okay, let's go ahead and start. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. We've got an international group today. Um, welcome to the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge webinar on the affordability of appliances. My name is Sean Davey. Um, I am part of the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge team, and I am the facilitator of this webinar. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jackie Garcia. I'm sure you're all familiar with her um, throughout the Design Challenge. A bit of housekeeping before we begin. First, a reminder that this webinar is intended for participants of the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge, an initiative led by Efficiency for Access and supported by Engineers Without Borders UK. This webinar is recorded and, and the cameras and microphones of everyone, but the main speakers are disabled, just so you know. However, please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar and particularly during our Q&A session. Um, if you do ask a question during this, during um, the presentations, we'll pick them up at the end in the Q&A session. Um, I would encourage you to do so because I'm excited to say we have gathered a great panel of speakers for the event today, um, and I'll introduce you to them very soon. First, a look at the agenda. So we'll go through our four guest speakers, um, and they'll all give presentations of around 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll follow this up with the Q&A period where you can ask any questions you have to them. Um, one of our speakers today, Joshua Milburn, is um, in Japan. So he recorded his section at the webinar. Any questions that you might have for him, you can say there for him in the chat and I'll follow up um, in an email and he'll get back to us following the webinar offline. Um, and then finally, before we close, we'll have a, a webinar feedback survey. So um, we just want to hear your input on, on the webinars, help us improve them in the future. Okay. So I just want to give you as much time for the Q&A as possible. So let's get through this. Um, first off, we have Matt Carr from Agsol. 
Um, Matt is a renewable energy technical and market access specialist. He has worked at the forefront of energy access throughout the Pacific, Asia, and Africa with solar startups, international power companies, multilateral donors, and NGOs prior to co-funding AgSol in 2016. Then we'll hear from Alex Clayton from MCOPA. Alex Clayton is an MCOPA commercial product manager. He is responsible for managing MCOPA's portfolio of commercially available products and bringing new products to scale in MCOPA's market through organic growth and strategic strategic partnerships. Previously, he was a part of MCOPA's research and development team. MCOPA's labs, where he had led the development of a higher power system and grid appliances. Before MCOPA, Alex worked with Global Giving to grow their crowdfunding platform in Australia in the technology practice of Addy Partners, an investment management firm in San Francisco. Joshua Milburn from Angaza will follow with his recording. At Gaza, Joshua builds open source technology, expanding energy access, including Nexus Key Code, the industry standard token protocol powering two, 2 million PayG devices worldwide. With the support of Efficiency for Access, his team released Nexus Channel Core, a hardware agnostic solution for device to the device interoperability for even the most constrained devices. He will share how adapting existing industry standards to the specific needs of the industry provides a common language for device communication, while also enabling manufacturers to innovate faster, provide unique value-added features to end devices. Finally, we'll hear from Alana Cohen from GSMA. Alana Cohen is the Senior Market in Engagement Director for the GSMA Mobile for Development Utilities Program. The program has played a key role in catalyzing the early pay-as-you-go energy sector and has supported the re replication of this model to other sectors. For the nearly eight years, Alana has supported the, the development of partnerships between the mobile industry and utility server service providers. This includes oversight of the program's innovation funding, which provides grants to test and scale innovative mobile-enabled utility service models and production of industry insights. Alana holds an MSc in Water Science Policy and Management from Oxford University and a bachelor's degree in Biology from Brandeis University. So, without further ado, please take it away, Matt. Um, he's just told me that he has some connection issues, so bear with us if, if it takes a little bit of time to go. Can you hear us, Matt? Yeah, thanks, Sean. I, I, it's, a, it's a bit scratchy here. I've been uh, switching between the two connections available to me and neither seem particularly great. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, hearing you loud there. Okay, cool. Um, okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name's Matt Carr. I'm uh, the, the founder and CEO or co-founder and CEO of AgSol, and we specialize in the, uh, the manufacture of solar-powered agro-processing machines. Uh, next slide, please, Sean. Okay, so the, just this is just a you know a, a, a founding statement here. You know that the the majority of people that have or don't have access to electricity, most of them are smallholder farmers and depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. Uh, next slide, please. So when we are talking about the um, productive machines, um, or, or at, at least solar productive machines that can serve uh, serve the agriculture value chains, it's typically, it's typically recognised that these these three groupings of technologies uh, present the greatest potential to uh, for, for for impact and to 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 catalyse this kind of second generation of or second wave of, of energy access. Um, so yeah, Axel's focus is, is predominantly, well, primarily on, on agro-processing, uh, but we very much see our product as a, as a tool that's kind of part of a bigger or broader toolkit um, with, with other appliances like refrigeration, like um, that can provide kind of broader, greater, more holistic uh, uh, solutions to people living in off-grid areas. Next slide, please, thanks, Sean. So when you look at um, 
the the demand for agro-processing, you know, where I, I'm based here in, in Kenya and, and our, our market focus uh, at, at this moment is, is in the East Africa region. Um, our primary focus is on, on cereals. Um, the, the, the most important of them in this part of the world is, is maize. And the, the opportunities presently for, for off-grid people to process their maize to an edible product because it does need processing before they can eat it, is either doing it manually um, or using 100-year-old technology, which is a diesel-powered mill. Um, a couple of things that's worth uh, so when we look at look at that, that's a it's a you know it's a huge tech um, energy jump to go from manual processing to you know the small typically the smallest diesel-powered mills are 10. Power, uh, they're, they're large. They're um, you know they're they're the only solution available in off-grid areas. So you know we are are tying the gap between um, you know manual processing and and diesel mills ultimately to uh, decentralized and create a much more decentralized network of milling stations. Um, just a couple of stats there down the bottom of that slide. Milling is always done by, or the responsibility for milling is always done by women, um, and um, you know sometimes they they uh, outsource that to their children. Um, but there's there's a huge hardship accessing uh, milling technologies in off-grid areas. You know, in in worst case scenarios, women women are walking five plus kilometres to get to the nearest mill. Um, and and it's a big, you know, there's there's a lot of money spent on on processing grain so you know just in a collection of east african countries there's over a billion usd annually at milling at milling stations uh those typically being diesel mills next slide please so axel's been working on you know in this space for um four or five years now and you know we're, we're at iteration four of our kind of of our product uh, product range, and you know, I, I suppose one that highlights the, you know, how how complex this is um, to get the unit economics right for for milling, and I'll I'll come back to some of those challenges later in the uh, presentation. But this is our this is our current product that we're piloting in uh, in Kenya and Uganda present at the moment. This is version 1.0 of our of our new micro mill. And it's designed. There's a. It, it's designed for for processing grains, whether they be maize, uh, sorghum, millet. It can also do uh, dried tubers like uh, cassava. Um, it is. It uses like a, a high spec uh, brushless DC motor uh, in in direct draft format, uh, which is uh, one primarily to to reduce costs and re reduce losses in power transmission. Uh, it does have a, a lithium-ion battery uh, behind it. Uh, that's that's a kind of an essential piece for a, a mill because you always need power to be kept up to the to the uh, milling head. Um, it's smart. Uh, what I mean by smart, there's you know there's a lot of uh, um, custom that we we build our, our own kind of microprocessor that runs the mill. Uh, another innovation in the mill is it includes incorporates an automatic feed control mechanism, and that's a that's an industry first for any any small mill of this variety. Um, uh, what that means is that the operator can be entirely unskilled and have have no uh, kind of mechanical uh, uh, you know technical capabilities. All they need to do is ensure that the grains are clean, and they load the mill and the and the uh, and the mill. The automatic feed control system and the and the microprocessor takes takes care of everything else. Um, we interoperable. So uh, presently, with the current version, we have some the mill operates on a 48 volt uh, system, uh, but we have some small power conversion gear inside. So uh, so you, we can run 12 volt appliances or, or um, a range of 12 volt appliances off the system. And the the kind of the IoT and Pago piece that's a that's a uh, part of the product product development and process. Next slide, please. So we started the our, our field trial for the micro meal um, about five months ago, 
And you know, these are the these are the numbers that we were. Oh, it looks like there's a. Sorry, I think there's something not quite right with that second uh, second table. Um, but these were the numbers that we were um, assuming that we would be that we would see from the from the pilot. So the mill mill has a production rate of uh, of about thirty kilograms per hour. Uh, we were assuming it would be running it for four hours a day. Um, that that would be producing, you know, 120 kilograms of flour uh, with a with a daily gross income of of six dollars. Um, there's the the few the the, the numbers uh, un, under the next kind of the customer business case highlights would be that you know the the mill would be sold for one and a half thousand dollars at a retail price so that that's for the full system and then with a uh, on on pago financing there'd be a 20 percent down payment and uh which would then and then over a 24 fi 24 month financing period that would uh, require a dollar 65 daily payback so if we're seeing a daily gross income of six dollars you know the take home would be you know, a, a little above four dollars, which which um, uh, we uh, we we see as a as a reasonable kind of income for a small uh, rural business. So there you see in the bottom, the reality has been uh, different, and um, and and I'm just going to discuss through uh, you know what what the results of our pilot have been so far. Um, you know the challenges that we've experienced, and you know what that means for for us as a as a uh, technology developer and provider going forward. So the first um, primary challenge that we we've, we've seen is that the with the the field trials, and you know, admittedly, it's from a fairly small um, data set. There's there's ten mills in the field uh, presently. We're only seeing a daily utilization rate of of 1.5 hours or less per day. Um, uh, compared to what we were expecting, which was something more like four hours. So the mill can, in fact, run for six hours a day. So the, the utilization rate that we're seeing is, is less than 25% of what the mill can do, uh, what the power system can do. Um, and that has, you know, uh, be kind of knock-on effects for the unit X. Meanwhile, what we're, what we're um, so, you know, one idea to, to counter that would be then to make a smaller mill um, or a, a smaller mill, lower power consumption, a smaller solar system. But, you know, meanwhile, what our customers are saying to us is that they want a mill that's faster, um, not slower. So uh, a faster mill means a bigger power system, which is in fact more cost. Um, and they're also asking for a cheaper mill. So, you know, that's, it, it kind of sets up a bit of a, a catch-22 dynamic there. Um, one of the other challenges around milling, and uh, particularly with solar milling, is that you know, with business as usual on with diesel mills, there's there's quite distinct um, uh, milling peak kind of demands during the day, and the the, the biggest peak that you see uh, with a with a diesel mill is later in the day, kind of from 4 p.m. onwards, and that's when 75% of the milling is done. So as you can imagine, with a solar mill, that doesn't lend itself particularly well. Um, so there's there's this aspect of, of kind of behavior change that, that needs to happen around milling, um, <coughs> or at least solar milling. The other the other um, kind of big takeaway from the field trial is that the the typical consumer financing model that you see applied in the in solar solar space is is, is typically around you know a 20% down payment of the of the product cost. Um, you know, and I think for productive use appliances, and particularly for for a solar milling appliance, uh, that needs to be uh, reevaluated, and that that uh, initial upfront payment needs to be increased. And that's kind of what we're we're also hearing uh, is being echoed from some of our partners who have uh, quite a bit of experience in the product space, particularly around around pumps. Matt, I think we've lost you for a second. Can you hear us? I think we'll just pause for one moment until Matt can rejoin. Hear us again. Can you hear us at all, Matt? 
Okay. We m Sorry, everyone. Seem to have some technical problems. This always happens when we have these online meetings. Matt, are you there? I see you've come back online with your mic. Okay, might give it one more minute and then we might have to move on to Alex's presentation. Matt, can you hear us? Okay, seems he's gone offline again. So maybe we can pick it up again um, towards the end, but for now, I think we'll move on to Alex's presentation. That's all right. Thanks for Matt. Matt, Matt, sorry, sorry, Alex. Matt was representing our um, our productive use and um, rapid return on investment um, portion of the affordability webinar, and um, um, Alex will now take us into the page e section. Great, thanks very much. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to um, stay connected the whole time. Let's see. <laughs> Um, great. So, so, hi everyone. So, so I'm here from um, MCOPA, which is a um, a predominantly a, a solo company, but doing pay-as-you-go products um, across mostly East Africa. So, we're in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Nigeria. Um, and my presentation is going to be focused a little bit more in the abstract on on sort of design principles and and what we consider to be or what I would consider to be important uh, to bear in mind when designing um, pay-as-you-go solutions and specifically pay-as-you-go. Um, appliances. So if we go to the next slide, uh, be great. Thanks. Great. So, so, so this is definitely not um, an exhaustive overview, but uh, but I just wanted to highlight sort of when when you're sort of thinking about designing a pay-as-you-go system and specifically a sort of a pay-as-you-go appliance, I think it's it's very tempting, and and even sort of um, you know in Copa's history, it's been very tempting to really focus on the product. So thinking about okay, well. You know, do we want a, a, a 24 inch TV and should it have, should it be HD, should it be smart, should it have a DVD port, all of these sorts of things. But I think that the, the key thing that, uh, that I think is worth highlighting and, and, and really a, the point that I want to get across today is that really in order to be successful when designing for pay to go, it's, it's essential to, to design for the system. Um, and so by the system, I mean the sort of the, the complete product life cycle and um, and, and sort of the, the, the full range of uh, things that you'll need to consider. So on, on the, the sort of beginning of that, of course, is thinking about the product. So you can either design in-house or, or now there's a pretty thriving um, industry of, of, uh, of, of just suppliers. So you can source quality products that people will need, value and use every day. And so we just heard from from Matt that, of course, you know, productive use is something that's that's really growing within the sector. And so maybe every day becomes every week or every few days uh, for for people who are uh, buying, for example, a water pump or a mill or whatever it might be. Um, and that might be enough. But but certainly for the core pay-as-you-go um, uh, solar industry, the majority of those use cases um, are things that customers will use every day. And so it's worth bearing in mind here that not everyone is uh, sorry, not, not all products are necessarily compatible for, for this pay-as-you-go model. So, for example, um, like an easy one to think about is, is washing machines. You know, washing machines is a laundromat that really is a pay-as-you-go product because you go, you, you put, your, put your money in and, and, and the, uh, the washer works. Um, but that's not something necessarily that people, number one, use every day. And number two, that, that people would necessarily want to have in their house and would prioritize as sort of a, a use of their finances. So the actual selection of product is, is, is of course important as it is with any other business model, but there is a barrier with pay-as-you-go, making sure that the product is compatible specifically for the pay-as-you-go model and something that people will want to pay for on a recurring basis. Secondly, then you need to think about connectivity. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, and, and, um, but, but the key thing is that you need to be able to talk to your device. That's the essence of pay as you go. You need to be able to lock it and unlock it. Um, and then beyond that, you can decide to add additional features. So for example, um, you might want to do performance monitoring so you can understand uh, you know, if there are any issues with your device or, or being able to do some predictive analytics on the battery. Um, but you do need to design with connectivity in mind. So you, you can decide how you want to do it, but you can't forget about it. 
Thirdly, then, is, is on payments. So, um, of course, another aspect of this is that you need to be able to handle payments. So there, there are, again, a lot of different approaches to this, but you need to be able to process payments, so collect money from your customers. And then you really, the, the bit that's behind the, uh, so the under, under the hood of all of this, is you also need to have a, a pretty sophisticated understanding of load management um, and, and how, you can, how you can allocate credits in exchange for the cash that you've received to your customers. So that, again, needs to be something that is considered from the beginning when you're, when you're designing your product. Um, fourthly, then, is, is thinking about sales. So this sounds obvious, and it's true, of course, of, of any product development uh, process, but, but you really need to understand how you plan on getting it to customers. So this should be right at the beginning of your design process, then understanding, okay, do you want to develop your own sales force? Um, that's something that MCOPA has done in Kenya. We have uh, just over 4,000 salespeople in Kenya. But that's a very labor intensive and, uh, and, and, and is quite slow to scale. So that's something that you do need to bear in mind. And, and on the more practical side is what if you're developing a product that's enormous. Um, we recently, a couple of years ago, launched a fridge. That's very, very different to how you would manage the sales of a big product as you, than you would selling something small like a phone. So you need to uh, uh, design for that as well. And finally, then servicing. So the essence of the pay-as-you-go model is that the customer wakes up every day and decides that they want to pay for your product. So it's essential when designing for pay-as-you-go that you also design for, with servicing in mind. So um, you know you need to think about: Will you have a sales force in the field? Will, uh, sorry, a, a maintenance team in the field? Will you be able to have a call center? All of these different things um, th that ultimately will impact how you design your product and also how you think about servicing it. So I think the, the, the overarching point that I'm trying to uh, make here is that it has to be a, a systems view and it has to consider the entirety of the value chain because ultimately they are all related. So if we go to the next slide, please. Great. So, so really the, the important thing or not, not, well, one of the important things then is how this all manifests, which is, which is around unit economics. And so this, I think, is, is, is one of the bits that potentially is easy to overlook in pay as you go. But that is to say that, that the product only accounts for a small portion of, uh, of the actual cost to the customer, or the price to the customer. And so, as I've said, it, it's a complex and, and quite an expensive business model. Um, and so you need to be able to, as you're designing these appliances and as you're thinking about business models, you need to be able to sort of price these in from the beginning. Um, and the nature, of course, of pay as you go is that if, you're, if you have, for example, a two-year payment plan for a customer or, or, or even a one-year payment plan for a customer is that if you get these assumptions wrong then ultimately this comes back to bite you in a year's time or, or two years time when you don't get your margin and so and so that really is is something that that i would really encourage as, as you're thinking about designing um pay as you go appliances is that it's it, a lot of time needs to be focused on on the business model and understanding the the, the full impact of the unit economics so customer research, when you're doing it, um, willingness to pay is notoriously difficult. Um, uh, it's specifically very difficult for something that, is, uh, that, that has hundreds or, or, or even thousands of micropayments. But it's really important to be able to get your willingness to pay research right. Um, and the first part of that is, is making sure that you've got the right price that, that you actually will be, able to, um, will be able to position to your customers. And so what, what does this mean then for the actual products itself? So when you're designing your products um, and, and thinking about appliances and thinking about you know, weighing up things like efficiency versus uh, sort of simple technologies and, and things that you can buy off the shelf, ultimately that means that, that for, for every dollar of, of cost that you put into the product, that is compounded over time by the amount of you know, financing that will be required in order to be able to, to make it pay as you go, um, and, and then also things like, you know, the bigger the product is, the more cost it will take in your, um, in your distribution channels and, and, and through your sales process. So when you're, you know, as, as you're going through this process, it's really important to think about, okay, well, what are the trade-offs? And bearing in mind that the trade-offs occur throughout the value, uh, the value chain. And so, and so you, you sort of really need to be able to, to have this whole system-wide view. And finally, as I've said at the bottom here, the key thing as well is that because the customer is paying every day, the product you need to optimize for reliability and quality 
so that on day 375, that the customer is just as excited about paying for the product as they are on day five. Um, and, and, so, and so really, the, the exciting thing about pay as you go is that it's a very pure form of business, which is that you, you know, it, it is beholden upon the supplier to be able to uh, uh, create something that the, that the customer is genuinely happy with because the customer makes a decision every day uh, that the product is worth paying for. So if you go to the, the next slide, please. So in summary then, or, or sort of taking a more specific view at each, of these, uh, at each of these different steps, I would just highlight these are sort of the, 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 key, the key areas that I would encourage you all to consider as you're thinking about designing, uh, designing these solutions. So of course, on the product side, the number one thing you need to think about is what problem you're solving and who you're solving it for. That's the same with any products that you might want to develop. Um, but it's you know it, it, it's critical of course in, in this example so for example if, if you're designing for an urban user in somewhere like nairobi then that's that's a very very different uh, uh, sort of supply scenario and, and sort of demand side uh, context is extremely different from what you might expect if you're designing for someone in a much more rural or um, or, or or sort of yeah lower income uh, category and so you need to get that right from the beginning and be very very clear on on your identifying um, and understanding your customer i think then as as i've highlighted as well the suitability for pay as you go not all products are really designed for pay as you go um, and and something that's really interesting that uh, that matt touched upon uh, briefly is is that actually also there are different types of pay as you go as well so um, there are different ways of approaching it um, but you should also be clear on, on how, you, how you want to do it and whether that's something that's a daily payment, whether it's a weekly payment um, or, or even just a payment in installments. So there are lots of different ways that, that you can manage that. Um, the, the, the dichotomy between an open and closed system, this is a, a really interesting one that, that is a sort of debate across the sector and I think both, both approaches are worthwhile. Um, the definition of open and closed is that, uh, so MCOPA actually has closed systems, and that is that we control all of the appliances and accessories within our ecosystem. Um, so, so you can't plug in a, a laptop or a, a, you know, a lamp or whatever it might be to our battery systems. You can only use our own appliances. So that's something else that you'll need to, to bear in mind. Um, and, then, and then finally on this product section, just really thinking about end of life. I, I think you know, this is becoming a more prominent discussion within the sector. And I do think that it's something that, that, that should really be, uh, be, be considered from the beginning when designing uh, new appliances. So um, really thinking about, are we adding unnecessary complexity? Is, is there a way that we can use, for example, a natural refrigerant rather than a uh, chemical that's harmful and, and, and various different consider considerations like that? Um, I won't go into all of the, uh, the different considerations here, but, but I'm sure that, the, um, that, that they'll be made available after. Um, but, but I would just really encourage you all to, to bear in mind that, that designing appliances and, and thinking about designing systems really should be considered from a holistic point of view. And I think especially for, for sort of a, um, the perspective of a student rather than necessarily someone working within the industry, that can be challenging. But the good news is, is that the industry, I think, increasingly is, is becoming more and more open um, and, and the value chain is also getting uh, broken up a little bit. So you've got more and more companies who, who, for example, are focusing on, you know, we'll help you do the distribution or, you know, we, we'll manage your loan book for you or, uh, or, or even um, uh, on the product side, more and more people are allowing people to, to, to source their products indirectly. So um, I'd really encourage you to, to, when you're thinking about these systems, to go out and, and do that research, maybe even speak to those uh, companies. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's, that, that's sort of the, the, the main point that I want to drive home uh, today is, is that designing for pay as you go really needs to be designing from end to end as a pay as you go solution. Um, and, and I hope that some of these points, uh, I hope these are a helpful point of reference. So thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. That was great. And uh, it provides a lot of um, practical uh, design elements for our, for our participants. Um, yeah, and, and Alex is right. All of this material we shared with you after the webinar, I'll send an email to all of you with um, the slides. Um, I see that Matt is now back online. Matt, would you want to say some closing remarks about your presentation? Uh, sure, happy to. 
I actually don't know where I uh, left off um, earlier, so I might have been <laughs> talking uh, to myself for a while. Um, but look, you know, just to just to wrap up, um, you know, the, you know, some of the, I, I, I was, I think I kind of had covered like some of the challenges that we'd seen with our, our field trial, um, and um, which which weren't as uh, you know, which were kind of a little bit unforeseen. I suppose you know the thing here is that the you know in this in this space, in particular productive use space, um, you know milling is by far the least uh, developed uh, or, or mature product, and and no one's cracked it yet. No one's no one's got a a product or a business model that that fits. So you know we we are at this um, you know the leading edge of of trying to work this out. Um, and and you know I echo everything that I just heard Alex. Uh, mention about um you know really keeping having your customer in mind and knowing the market but and um and, and being able to you know iterate and 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 respond to challenges as they as they kind of uh, uh present themselves you know and it would be you know it would be fabulous for us to 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 have the you know a a, a, a the the yellow brick road kind of leading us to product and business model success but the the reality is that um you know with with all the you know market research that uh, that that might be at your disposal and the hypotheses that you kind of you bring uh to to product development from from that market research you know that there is a point um in in the product development um uh, uh life cycle where where that the, where those hypotheses need to be tested and you know and, and as as we have found um you know they they don't always stack up so you know for us we're we're now exploring um our, our kind of v2 product design there's some technical um considerations to that it's it's making it more productive making it um uh, in terms of of faster in terms of improved efficiency because again efficiency this key factor around reducing the uh, the the uh, the other kind of components of a, of the solar system that we have no control over the pricing of those things they're just commodities. Um, the your cost reduction in 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 the mill, um, offering it in different power supply formats. So you know at, at the moment we've only really tested it as a in solar mill format for the you know this particular customer segment of village entrepreneur um but you know once we have this core the the you know the, the core module of the machine which is the milling the milling piece it's quite easy to to offer it in some uh put some power conversion gear in front of it so we can offer it as a as an ac format for um for mini grids or in for a context where there's a you know the power tariff is relatively high or or offer it in AC with battery for for weak grid, um, and um, and yeah, there's you know I won't I won't kind of delve into all the details of, about you know where we're exploring improvements on the on the product side. Um, also, you know what that means for exploring and testing different customer segments, um, and uh, exploring and testing and working with different distribution partners. And um, and finally, you know, this the financing model. I think, you know, as as Alex was saying, this is you know the paygo piece, the consumer financing thing. It's it is um, it is very tricky, and I think different rules apply to some of these productive appliances. And um, you know, where we are, you know, in an exploratory phase to try to work out, you know, where <coughs> excuse me, where these intersecting lines of Kind of product market customer segment and, and whatever all kind of intersect um but yeah we uh still feel as confident as ever that there a solution does exist and and that it has a very very you know immense scale for impact in in the in the off-grid sector given the the um you know high demand for, for milling services in off-grid areas um so i'll i'll leave it there thanks uh thanks Sean. thanks uh, jackie Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Okay, great. And it's great to see these different perspectives presented here today um, for you all to take away for your own designs. Um, okay, um, it, okay. I'm going to be presenting um, Joshua's section, which was recorded, but just to note that we, it seems like we'll be running um, pretty close to the end of time by the end presentations are are done so um 
please write your questions in the chat in the meantime that you might have, and we can pick them up offline over email um, with the panelists, in, um, and that'll give us time to collect them before it's over. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share Joshua's presentation now. Can everyone see this? Hello, and welcome to this webinar on device interoperability and how it applies to affordable appliances in this industry moving forward. I'm Josh, uh, working on Gaza, primarily on connected embedded devices and securing the communications between those devices, as well as between those devices. Can everyone see this? I don't, I just wanted to check before, keep, before I kept going. Alex, yes. I see that you turn on. Yep. Okay. Well, between those devices and the cloud. I'll be talking today about something we've been working on with industry partners called Nexus Channel 4 and how it relates to this entire topic. But first, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, today, we have mostly these standalone pay to go devices, which I think you're familiar with. You, know, you buy a device, it has typically a keypad on it, the user pays for an amount of uh, money, and they get credit. They type it into the device, and it works. And uh, everything from small solar home systems to handheld lanterns to larger lighting systems, it's a pretty common model. Uh, you'll see it across the industry. So I won't get too into it other than to say there's some challenges today as we start to see larger and uh, more complex systems in homes. For example, a user might buy a solar home system on a pay-as-you-go basis, then six months or a year later, buy a separate pay-as-you-go TV meant to be standalone. Now they're receiving two key codes, one for the TV and one for the solar home system to enable it. Uh, and this scales with the number of appliances that are meant to be standalone that they buy. It's an issue for the user and usability. It's an issue for support because if the user has a mistake entering a key code, uh, how does support disambiguate user entry versus a product problem? It's a lot harder uh, because they don't know, okay, well, was it entered in the right device? Uh, was it entered in that device in the order of this other key code before or after it? Uh, it's not It's not totally clear. It's just a lot more troubleshooting. Uh, besides pay as you go, there's energy prioritization issues. Let's say a user has a TV and a fridge and they would like to know if I use my TV tonight for you know four hours, will my fridge be able to run until the morning? They can answer it heuristically based on past experience, but there's not really a great way to do that uh, in a standard fashion today. Um, and devices from different manufacturers can't exactly communicate that information easily. So let's say someone who's a great manufacturer at solar home systems and associated accessories, but maybe they wanna partner with someone who's really great at making refrigerators. Uh, now there's a lot of upfront R&D effort to make all these devices communicate uh, because they just are operating on different electrical and uh, physical link layers. So we're going to see larger interconnected systems in the future, uh, larger refrigeration systems, solar water pumps, uh, agricultural systems, and typically, I mean, these, these all need power in some way. So whether we're talking about solar, battery, intermittent grid, potentially we're all sharing from some power source at some point. And it would be great if they could communicate uh, in addition to the state of the battery and making decisions based on that, their own state, I mean, failure states, uh, control states, remotely updating the settings on these devices from another device. Uh, is there a way to do it in a way that you can understand how it impacts the whole ecosystem of devices that are connected there? Uh, and beyond just communicating in general, how do you do it securely? Let's say we're talking about refrigeration for medical cold chain. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want someone unauthorized to be able to just turn off the fridge and destroy a bunch of vaccines. So that's that's a separate concern, but still a concern here as well. And so, you know, there, a lot of these applications go beyond pay as you go, and it would be great if we had a way to solve this that wasn't just reinventing something that's already been done elsewhere in the IoT universe, uh, and it wasn't only specific to pay as you go. And so, it turns out there is a standard, uh, and it was standardized in 2018. It's from a group called the Open Connectivity Foundation. It's used today by large manufacturers like LG, Samsung, Intel, typically in uh, smart consumer electronics, and typically a lot larger scale. Uh, we're talking, you know, manufacturers who have very large global distribution networks, but not typically in the markets of interest. And so one of the limitations there is that these are typically designed for microcontrollers and uh, control hardware in these devices. It is a lot more expensive than what we see in most off-grid devices. Uh, and so that presents a problem because we'd love to use the standard, but we would not love to increase the bomb cost to do it. I mean, it's basically a non-starter in some cases. And without getting too much into the details here, uh, class zero, which is shown here, is not supported explicitly from the standard, is uh, a large number of devices in the market. 
use class zero microcontrollers. So what can we take from this? What is useful? Well, we can take uh, the application layer interoperability piece. Open Connectivity Foundation's uh, standard OCF has a lot of pieces, but one of the most salient pieces for our discussion here is this notion that devices should be able to communicate about some specific application. So they, they shouldn't need to worry so much about how they're connected electrically, how bytes are sent on the wire, but more about can I talk about some property of the device, like a battery or a fault status or something else at a very high level and design interesting applications around it, not do I have to get down to the bits for every single new device to integrate? And so that's when I say application layer, that's kind of what we're talking about here and allowing manufacturers to interoperate at that layer, independent of how they're connected below that, whether it's Bluetooth or some proprietary wired link, uh, and then security can be layered on top of that. So again, why do we care about application layer? We don't want it to be dependent on these lower transport layers. So let's say you build some standard that's built around uh, Bluetooth. Well, that's great, as long as devices use the current version of Bluetooth. Let's say we just picked the current PLD version. Well, five years from now, are we going to be able to source those chips? Are we going to be able to use the same standard uh, connectivity? Is Bluetooth even going to be affordable for some of the devices in the market, or does it exclude a lot of them? So you know, there are a lot of transport layer decisions which uh, could really lock you into a standard that might not be relevant in 10 years. And we're interested in building a standard that applications can be used and rely on for many years, independent of how devices are interconnected. Uh, so obviously pay as you go state is one application, but I mean, you might have standard ways to hold devices and get telemetry data back. You might want to share limited battery resources. Uh, they're basically any application. It's not really uh, specific to one use case or another. The idea is if you can have an application layer language that all these devices talk, uh, you can develop any application you want, just speak that language and expose the resources you care about. So let's get into what resources are a little more. That's the core piece we're taking out of this OCF standard, which is the notion that I can define something like a battery or a TV or an inductive stovetop state, and I can define properties on that resource. So I can say a battery has voltage, a battery has capacity, a battery always has these properties. Maybe it has some other optional properties as well, like other cells have a status. Um, but if everyone agrees that you know a battery at least must report capacity and let's say voltage, um, as an example, you know then any device that implements that battery resource uh, can be pulled by another device that says, "Do you have a battery resource?" And if so, oh great, tell me the percentage you, uh, of capacity you have left, and I'll make a decision based on that. So it allows you to write application logic without having to go into the weeds every single time. Uh, but it doesn't prevent you from having more specific proprietary use cases. So what I described there was a battery that had certain mandatory properties like capacity and voltage, but you might define some other specific ones that are value adds that only work you know, with a little additional integration work. Again, we're all speaking the same language to talk to these devices though. So it's still less work than customizing integration with a very specific link layer all the way uh, from the bottom up. Uh, so we have some example resources out right now you can go check out. Uh, there's some that, you can, that are in development. And I think I want to take a look specifically here at uh, so this battery resource, just to get a better idea of what these kind of look like. Uh, it's intended to be very clear to a web developer or someone who's you know, not deep in the embedded hardware. And this isn't something that you know we came up with in-house. This is essentially drawn straight from the OCF standard and how you represent this. You have, you have some kind of endpoint, like slash battery, and you have a certain set of parameters that are just defined. You say, you know, batteries always have CP and MB in this example, millivolts and capacity. And if you pull the battery resource, you can get that information. In this case, you can actually set something related to the low battery state of charge if you're authorized as well, posting back to it. So even though under the hood, you know, there's no web servers, there's no you know, HTTP running on these devices, from an application developer's perspective, it looks like that's what's happening. And so it makes it easy for the application developers without making the hardware and software constraints on the device uh, you know, without violating those uh, low cost constraints. You don't have to put like a embedded Linux processor in here to get this kind of behavior. So uh, we're just gonna breeze through this, but the pieces we're talking about here are mainly in blue, how devices talk to each other. There's an entire other set of work here around security and how that interplays with platforms. Uh, we're not gonna talk about that today, but I just wanna emphasize that it's important to have a standard way for devices to talk to each other about what they can do and about what the state of the system is without relying on 
specific integrations between every single device and every single manufacturer. And that's really what Nexus Channel Core is about. Um, so you know, currently, we have a release with some examples on GitHub of battery resources implemented. And you can run that on a microcontroller. Uh, we've been granted uh, resources from Efficiency for Access to bring this out as an industry standard. And we're actively working with Solaris who's developed a really innovative uh, lower link layer from you know, defining how things should be wired electrically up to how the bytes are sent on the wire. So the devices can connect using that link layer and then run Nexus Channel Core on top of it for at least higher level application uh, examples. So that's uh, all I have to talk about right here. Uh, feel free to email me any questions and uh, thanks for listening to this presentation. Okay, thanks to, thanks to Josh. Uh, he's working on some really exciting technology at Gaza. Um, if any of you had any difficulty with the sound, um, please let me know. This, I mean, we'll um, we'll have um, we'll share it in the um, final recording, um, and we'll make sure it's in there so you can look at see it back, etc. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Alana. Um, just so everyone knows again, we're running out of time, so I think uh, we won't have time for a Q&A session, but you're open to send your questions in or send them over email and we can answer them offline. Um, okay, so if you don't mind taking it away, go ahead, Alana. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Great, and apologies, um, there's some technical difficulties getting my webcam cooperating with the operating software here on my computer. So we'll go without the webcam. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I won't take too long, so I will get us done in time. Um, my name is Ilana, and I work at the GSMA uh, in our Mobile for Development Utilities program. If you go to the next slide, I'll just explain a little bit about who GSMA is and our program. So the GSMA is the Association for the Mobile Industry. So that means we represent the interests of mobile operators worldwide. We're actually made up of a number of separate entities within the GSMA, and one of those is the GSMA Mobile for Development Foundation, where we drive innovation in digital technology to reduce inequalities on our world. And specifically, I work on our Mobile for Development Utilities program, where we're concerned with the billions of people who lack access to essential utility services like energy, water, and sanitation, and so we are looking at ways that digital technologies can enable affordable and reliable, and sustainable utility uh, services, um, particularly focused on low income populations and those in, in urban and peri-urban areas. So that's, that, that mention of urban is a bit of a shift. Um, and we've, for the last eight years, done a lot of work both in rural and urban contexts. Um, so if you go to the, oh, well, we'll go to the next, Slide, but um, also to mention that our, our program is uh, funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So if we go to the next slide, I'm sorry, these are so the, I'm a little bit small here, I'm seeing. Um, apologies for that. Um, in terms of how we do that work, one of the main activities in the middle there is de-risking and catalyzing innovative utility services. And we've been doing this for the last eight years through an innovation fund where we've given grants for organizations to trial and scale these models. A lot of those grants have been aimed at understanding, really catalyzing a lot of what you've heard about today, some of the early pay-as-you-go solar models. And, and Popo was an early um, grantee of our program back in 2013 when these models were first uh, kicking off and there was more need to explore the relationship between these models and mobile operators. And so out of those grants, what we do is we share insights um, and we do also additional research to really share with the broader industry um, how, these, how these solutions can work um, and best practices. Um, and then we do a lot of partnership facilitation and convening um, to ultimately achieve impact at scale. So if we go to the next slide, um, what I wanted to firstly talk about, I think it's pretty clear from the presentations that we've heard about around the synergies between off-grid energy and mobile operators. Um, so we don't need to go into too much detail here, but for the pay-as-you-go solar companies or appliance manufacturers, we've heard about how it's essential for payments, for remote monitoring, uh, also for communication with staff and with clients, and let's not forget the the basic need to really call customers um, and check on them. It's a, it's a huge, 
huge need. Um, I think the emerging area still is on the big data analytics. I think there's been a lot of excitement around this one for a long time. First, for the reason of wanting to do credit scoring on customers. Um, that has, I think, um, not been seen in practice as much as we would have liked due to the complications around um, security concerns and I think really understanding what is the value for a mobile operator given the risks, um, what's the value of that information, um, of sharing that information, um, which I think is sort of still a question mark for them. So it it's an emerging area. I think the area that we're seeing more um, big data analytics work around now is on using mobile data to predict um, locations uh, for these solutions. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have at GSMA done some work though to quantify the value that mobile operators get from off-grid solar. Um, this is a study done in five countries looking at the usage of mobile money and mobile services and the overall revenue that brings to an operator when somebody gets pay-as-you-go solar and then comparing that to customers without pay-as-you-go solar. And I won't go through these all in depth, but the trend is clear that a pay-as-you-go solar customer is valuable for a mobile operator, and it does increase the, the revenue for them. Um, so that is a really important relationship to understand because uh, mobile operators are, are highly commercial entities, and they're not um, really, I think they're interested in social impact, but it has to come with commercial impact as well. So if we go to the next slide, I think my main points are really here that we can discuss. Um, just to talk through what I, what I think are some of the things to consider around affordability when it comes to the mobile angle. And some of these have been discussed a little bit. Um, you know, we heard um, from MCOPA about um, the cost of distribution and sales. And very early on in this industry, there was a lot of hope that mobile operator agent networks could be used to quickly achieve scale. Um, for sales, and I don't think that that's actually, that hasn't really proven the case. Um, Copa uh, changed their model away from that for the most part, though there's still, I would say, a, a strong branding relationship with Safaricom um, in, in Kenya, at least. But um, I hope there's a blog up just today about uh, that relationship. Mobile money fee structures vary across markets. This is something really important to understand. We have a toolkit that helps you think through um, in part the cost of applying mobile money. Um, so there's a choice between having the solar appliance provider pay for the cost of the transaction or the, um, or the, the end user. Um, see, I'm really running short on time here, so I might just have to run through these quite quickly. Um, the, I think another thing here is the mobile data cost. We heard a little about, about this already. There's a lot of design considerations here. We have a toolkit that's a little bit around this IoT journey um, to help point out some of the, the key points for, for thinking about cost. Um, I guess the, you know, starting with, I think, keypad versus a GSM system, right? You, you don't have to necessarily use, use monitoring. It's a very popular choice where there's networks um, and where you're gonna use that information, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's a necessity, and it's really important to think about the actual needs that you have, especially when launching a product because of the way it increases the cost. We heard a lot of, from MCOPA about really understanding um, your product market fit um, based on willingness to pay. I think that's really important, and that's sort of the second to last bullet point there about the cost of the loan versus the product cost and getting, getting the right fit there. The last point is an emerging area, but we think there's a potential role of digital tools where we see a lot of interest in government and donor financing through things like end user subsidies, um, where we have some blogs on this topic, and results-based financing. I think if you can go to the next slide, I will wrap up. Um, just to say that there's obviously, you know, we started with a lot of pay-as-you-go solar home systems, but there's been quite an evolution. I think the exciting thing here is that um, is not only the that we're talking about energy appliances, um, but there's a whole world of uh, now pay-as-you-go water solutions and some sanitation solutions. So all very exciting. And uh, we'll share the decks with everyone, and I've just highlighted some useful resources.
for your, your follow-up reading. So sorry to rush a bit, but thank you all and um, happy to, to get in touch with any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much for, for that, Alana. And um, sorry about the time crunch at the end. Um, and sorry to everyone for any technical difficulties we encountered today, but um, we'll be sharing the recording and the slide deck with you today. And uh, my colleague Jackie will be putting um, the email that you can send your questions to into the chat. Um, and you can send all your questions there and we'll pick them up after the webinar offline. Finally, I'd like to thank all of our um, panelists today for coming coming out and um, speaking. It was really informative, and I think um, all of you can take some really practical design elements into your um, into your projects. Um, thank you, and and you'll be presented with a one minute um, survey at the end of this webinar. If you could just fill that out um, before you leave. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thanks very much.